Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Performance and Interpretation of Arterial Physiologic Testing. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. On the left sidebar, please note the Resources tab. Click this tab for links to today's handouts, which include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides, plus a bonus handout, Practice Case Reviews. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SVU CME credit, you must be registered logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenters. With us today are Dr. Anne-Marie Kapinski and Dr. Joanne Lohr. Dr. Kapinski is the Clinical Professor of Radiology at Albany Medical College in Albany, New York, and President of North Country Vascular Diagnostics in Altamont, New York, and a past member of the IAC Vascular Testing Board of Directors. Dr. Lohr is General and Vascular Surgeon at Lohr Surgical Specialists in Cincinnati, Ohio. Both are true experts in the field, and we are happy to have them with us today. And with that said, I will now turn the webinar over to our first presenter, Dr. Anne-Marie Kapinski. Doctor? Well, hello, everybody. And I'm going to jump right in and tell you some of little trips and pitfalls and tricks that you need to know about performing arterial testing. Um, when we talk about arterial testing from a physiologic standpoint, the primary methods include either ABIs and TBIs, segmental pressures, analog CW, Doppler waveforms, and plethysmographic waveforms, or PBRs. Um, you can also, in conjunction with this, acquire spectral waveforms, but that's a, a topic for a, another webinar. Um, we do have equipment requirements to think about when we talk about the physiologic equipment we use. With a CW Doppler, obviously, we're going to want to select the most appropriate transducer. Um, we, if we're imaging or listening to, I should say, the pedal vessels, perhaps an 8 megahertz transducer would be more appropriate. If we're doing popliteal or common femoral vessels, perhaps a 5 megahertz transducer would be more appropriate, which all makes sense mm -hmm. to us. Um, the device needs to be able to demonstrate a uh, bidirectional flow. Uh, it should have an audible output because our ears are actually wonderful frequency analyzers and can help us along the way. Um, and it makes sense that we need to have a permanent recording. Um, the same is true for whatever device we use for plethysmographic waveforms. Uh, it should have the ability to make a permanent recording because if we don't record it and have proof we did it, we didn't really do it. Um, cuff size is important with uh, PVRs, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but most importantly, the, the device itself, the PVR system itself, must be capable of measuring small changes in volume. And this is important with our disease patients. It's even more important if we're doing digital studies where the pressure and volume changes in the digits very small. And in those cases, it's always good to check with your manufacturer to make sure that 
your tubing dead space and things like that is at a minimum so you can detect those changes appropriately. Now, cuff sizes. This is a, a big thing. Um, with cuff sizes, we want to know that we're using the right size cuff because limb pressures are going to be impacted by the cuff diameters. If we're using a cuff that's too narrow, we're going to need to apply excessive pressure to occlude that vessel. So we're going to get a falsely high pressure measurement. We've all learned this. If the cuff is too wide, the pressure is going to be falsely low. So generally speaking, most people will try to select a cuff that's about 20% wider than the diameter of the limb. Um, this slide I actually borrowed from uh, Hokinson's website, and it talks about the standard cuff sizes. Generally speaking, we're using a 10-centimeter cuff on the calf, an ankle, a 12-centimeter on the thigh, on the upper arm if it's heavier. If we're doing a four-cuff method, which I'll talk about in a second, um, the uh, we might want a 12-centimeter cuff that's a, a little bit longer for the upper thigh. Um, it, across the foot, if we're measuring a transmetatarsal waveform, or if we're looking at a waveform at a wrist, what we call the TM cuff, which has a seven and a half centimeter bladder, is important. And if we use a singular contoured cuff on the thigh, they come in 17 and 22 sizes, which actually have 18 and 24 centimeter bladders, which again, we would vary based on the body habitus. When we do this, the patient um, should be supine. Um, we need to have them rest for about 10 minutes. And with that, um, we don't have to put them in a room, get them undressed, and leave for 10 minutes. But we can put them in a room, get them undressed, put a drape over them, start putting cuffs on. And during that whole time of applying the cuffs, checking their signs and symptoms, checking their history, that will eat up about 10 minutes and you've allowed for them to rest. Um, one really important note, don't let the patients try to help you put the cuffs on because they will tense their muscles and the minute they relax, those cuffs will be too loose. So you can do it, ask them not to help and um, you'll get that cuff to fit a lot better and a lot more snugly. Anyways, let's talk about measuring uh, ankle brachial index. Um, with the ankle brachial index, this is the first test we primarily do. Um, we will um, insinate the, the dorsalis pedis artery, which is shown here on the left. Um, I don't believe you can see the arrow uh, on the screen uh, that I can on my computer, but we have a, a blue circle uh, along the top of the foot on the left, which is uh, circling the dorsalis pedis artery. Um, obviously, the dorsalis pedis artery is the continuation of the anterior tibial artery. We also insinate the distal posterior tibial artery just about the level of the ankle. We don't want to go too far below the ankle because you'll notice in the image on the, uh, the limb on the right side of the screen, uh, that's actually a posterior view. You'll see that posterior tibial artery bifurcates into the medial and lantern lateral plantar arteries pretty quickly, and we really want to be listening um, to the posterior tib and not one of the tributary branches. This slide illustrates um, actually listening for those Doppler signals, and you can see here um, on the left side of the slide, we're listening just behind the ankle here for the, dors the posterior tibial artery. And once we kind of get a signal, the little blue arrows indicate what I do next. I'll move laterally, side to side, to kind of improve that signal and wait for the largest signal. Um, same thing on the top of the foot when I'm listening to the dorsalis pedis. Once I get a spot, I'll move side to side to kind of get that loudest signal. Once we get to this point here um, and we've got the loudest signal, then we'll want to move and tilt the, the probe um, in terms of an angle back and forth, up and down, so we'll maximize that angle. One thing we definitely don't want to do is what this slide is illustrating in that we don't want to be pushing too hard 
onto the patient's limb um, because it, particularly if they have vascular disease, if we push too hard, we're going to be uh, pushing that vessel, um, partially occluding it and getting a false pressure measurement. Here's what I meant before about cuff size and, and a little bit about cuff placement. Again, 10 centimeter cuffs usually are what we can use around the calf, 12 centimeter on the thigh. And this slide illustrates the four cuff method here versus a three cuff method. And the, the many thighs, you just don't have enough room to put two cuffs side by side. You don't want them overlapping. The reason we do a four cuff method um, and Dr. Laura will probably speak to this a little bit more later, is that we can actually um, separate inflow disease from SFA disease when we're getting these two different pressure measurements. If we can't do two cuffs, we can use a singular contoured cuff, which actually will be a little bit better fit, um, but we're going to lose that delineation. But this is generally the setup here with our segmental pressure cuffs. Now, there are pitfalls associated with pressure measurements, and the biggest one is calcification. A lot of our patients don't even realize that they are diabetic or to whatever degree of renal failure they have. But in renal failure patients and diabetic patients, we get um, calcification, significant calcification, such that we will get normal or falsely elevated ABIs in the presence of vascular disease. Some people will use a cutoff of 1.3, other people will use a cutoff of 1.4. Either way, this is why you need to do these tests in conjunction with a waveform. Um, and that waveform, if it's flat, but your ABI is normal, should indicate you probably have some degree of calcification um, and that uh, ABI calculation is inaccurate. It certainly can be affected by poor cuff slot size or inappropriate cuff placement. Next thing we'll, we'll speak about, it's important to remember that when we do um, the indirect testing, that it is a quick and it is a, re a reproducible test. We can do it pretty easily. It works pretty well. And um, it's really nice that we can do it. And then the referring physicians can take that information to say what the next step is. Are we going on to further imaging? Are we going on to intervention in imaging? So we actually, with the physiologic testing, can really provide a lot of uh, background uh, for the physicians by which to make their decisions for patients. Okay, so we, caught, we talked about pressures. We talked about needing the right cuffs to get the right pressure measurements, listening, how we're going to zone in on that signal. The next step would be continuous wave Doppler, and we're going to use the same transducer we do for measuring segmental pressures. Um, these come in, in, obviously, various flavors in terms of their megahertz. As I said, somewhere around a 5 megahertz might be needed for the deeper vessels, 8 megahertz for the more superficial. Remember, these CW probes have two crystals, one constantly sending, one constantly receiving. So um, they're going to uh, hear anything in your path. You will pick up venous signals. So try to listen carefully that we don't confuse a venous signal for an arterial signal. You can give the, the base of the foot a little squeeze. Um, and augment the venous return a little bit. And if you hear that whoosh, you know you're probably over the vein and you need to move your transducer a little bit so you're more over the artery. I spoke earlier about angling it a little bit to get a good Doppler shift. And generally speaking, Doppler waveforms are recorded from the major vessels. Here's an illustration of, of uh, imaging from the con or imaging for a common femoral artery uh, waveform. Again, kind of sliding side to side to get the best signal and then tipping that transducer front to back to uh, improve the waveform we see. Behind the knee, um, the transducer is actually a little bit more perpendicular to the skin because the vessel actually takes a little bit of a dive. So we don't want to angle it much because the vessel is actually angling for us. Now, this I borrowed from the book by Bob Sissons and uh, Marcia Neumeyer that they published with Unetics years ago. 
Um, and it shows how easily you can take a pretty decent waveform and make it into a pretty terrible looking waveform just by angling your transducer incorrectly. So uh, it is important to be careful and uh, angle that appropriately so you can maximize that Doppler waveform. Some CW Doppler limitations. This is why I personally don't like CW is I find it a lot more dependent on the operator. Um, it is blind, so we're not sure if we're really listening to the vessel or perhaps a large collateral, which can impact what we see. Um, and uh, as I mentioned with the slide previous, a bad angle will affect our um, results. And we're going to get into plethysmography. Okay. Plethysmography just is a fancy word for measuring pressure changes that are the result of small volume changes. And there's a lot of ways we can do that, but how we do it primarily nowadays is with air plethysmography. That's the technique that's used with PVRs. Um, we put a cuff around the limb and that PVR cuff actually senses pressure changes that are the result of small volume changes that enter the limb. In the next slide, you'll see that diagram again with the cuffs. We use the same cuffs that we do for segmental pressures that we would for PVRs. And we add a small amount of air into each cuff and it is a predetermined amount that brings us to a set pressure of around 65 millimeters of mercury. At 65 millimeters of mercury, um, the pressure uh, in the cuff is enough to block venous outflow, so the only changes are the result of arterial inflow. And we'll do this over three or four cycles, um, cardiac cycles, to make sure we get a, a representative waveforms. In the next slide, um, plethysmography does have limitations, just like all the other techniques I mentioned. And probably the biggest one is we put the cuff on wrong or we use the wrong cuff. And if you look on the right side of the slide, you'll see a panel of three waveforms. And the calf and the ankle waveforms are pretty darn normal. They're, they're pretty close to textbook normal, but that thigh waveform is abnormal. And that often happens when the cuff is too loose um, or it's underinflated or perhaps uh, the patient moves. And also if they're particularly obese or edematous, that additional tissue under the cuff will actually cause the pressure wave to be muffled, so to speak. So we get um, a dampened waveform. Now, we'll take the next couple of minutes um, and talk about treadmill exercises. And um, we want to do exercise studies in some of our patients. Treadmills uh, is a good possibility if we have a treadmill. Um, we have our standard speeds and grades and we'll run them on the treadmill for five minutes or until their uh, symptoms cause them to stop. Um, in the next slide, many labs will record post-exercise pressures and calculate um, post-exercise ABIs. Um, there's really no need to do any kind of a waveform post-exercise. Um, and Dr. Moore will talk a little bit more about the um, diagnostic value of some of the changes we see. In the next slide, you'll see um, data from an actual treadmill study where you see the, the red line, which takes a big dip after exercises from the right limb, and it proves that there is vasculogenic claudication in this patient. And we'll follow that patient out because if, they're, if they have relatively mild disease, they may return to a normal pressure measurement sooner versus later. If they've got multi-level disease, it will take 10 or 12 minutes as it did in this particular patient. Now, um, the last few slides in terms of alternates to treadmill, you can see here that um, we can do toe ups, toe raises. Um, I used to do this with a patient. We'd always kind of wonder who would claudicate first maybe. Um, just stand and guide the patient to raise their to uh, up onto their toes about 50 times. And this will actually, by contracting those calf muscles, induce a similar response to the treadmill. Not exactly, um, but um, uh, it, it will be better than nothing. An, an alternate, another alternate in the next slide talks about post-occlusive reactive hyperemia, which I've also done 
where we use a cuff around the thigh or the calf. We inflate it above the systolic blood pressure and we leave it there for three to five minutes, release it and record those post-exercise pressures. The problem with that is it hurts. If you've ever tried it on yourself, it, it doesn't feel good. Um, you have to be a coach. You have to talk the patient through it in order to um, achieve these reactive hyperemia. So the very last um, technique I want to discuss is photoplethysmography, or PPG, which really isn't a type of plethysmography, but again, discussion for another time. It's a small transducer. There's two, actually. One emits a little infrared signal, and one detects that return of that infrared signal. The infrared wavelength goes into the tissue and bounces back off of red blood cells in the vicinity. And we use this for our digits, for our toes and fingers. We gather waveforms, and we can use it for pressures. We calculate toe brachial indices and ankle brachial indices. But the important thing is, is to keep our people warm when we're doing this because we don't want them vasoconstricted because of temperature changes. We want to be sure we're detecting any changes due to occlusive disease. Um, the next slide here shows a PPG toe position. You'll see two images here on the left is a toe with like this clothespin kind of clip um, that holds PPG uh, snugly in place, but not too tight. Um, on the right-hand side of that same slide, you'll see a toe with the PPG transducer attached via double-faced tape. Um, in the next side, slide, you'll see the setup for a toe pressure. If the toe is long enough, we can put a small cuff along the base and put the PPG transducer over the top of it, um, and what we'll do is gather the waveform just like we normally would, inflate the cuff pressure, um, look for the waveform to go away, release the cuff pressure, and we'll get our cuff, um, cuff pressure measurement in that way. In the next side, we see a hand um, with a similar setup uh, for measuring uh, pressure within the digits. Um, the next slide and, and second to the last slide for me is just showing a cold immersion study. We don't do these very often. Every lab has their own little way of doing it. This is one way you can do it. You can affix the PPG transducer, place the hands into some um, plastic uh, gloves or, uh, or latex-free gloves to keep everything dry, immerse the hands into the ice water, record your changes, take them out, and it does actually work pretty well. In conclusion, we did talk about ABIs and TBIs and segmental pressures and plethysmography. Those are the common techniques that are involved with, uh, with indirect physiologic testing. We've mentioned the pitfalls, including calcification with pressure measurements, obesity and edema impacting our waveforms, um, and technical issues such as improper transducer angles, as well as improper cuff size and placement. And lastly, we did speak briefly about exercise studies and alternatives to treadmill exercise. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much and turn it over to Dr. Lohr. Thank you, uh, Anne Marie. That was a, a great way of how to do it. Now we're going to talk about how we get to uh, what we're uh, trying to uh, interpret and what it means. Um, I have nothing to disclose, and um, we're going to go a little bit quickly here. But the ankle brachial index, just to remind everybody, is calculated by the highest of the systolic pressures in either the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial in the limb you're looking at, and then the highest of the right or left brachial blood pressures. If you look at this uh, um, drawing below here, you can see the blood pressure on the right arm is 135. On the left, it's 132. So we're going to use the 135 as the denominator. The right DBI is one, our uh, dorsalis um, fetus pressure is 180, and the posterior tibial is eight, 188. So we're going to divide 188 by 135 and get 139 on the right side. If you look at the waveforms for the right dorsalis fetus, they look nice and triphasic. The posterior tibial have a little bit of blunting, so there may be some disease in the posterior tibial artery, but the vessels appear to be somewhat non compressible, and the uh, ABI is a little bit artifactual. Same thing um, on the uh, left side. So if we're looking at the criteria to interpret studies of the segmental indices, uh, 130 to 140 in that range, we use 1.35 um, for falsely elevated non-compressibility, uh, 0.9 to 1.35 as normal, mild disease, 0.8 to 
moderate disease 0.5 to 0.8, severe disease less than 0.5, and ischemia that range is less than 0.35. A toe brachial index of uh, less than 0.7 is considered to be abnormal. And here you can see some of those calcifications that she was talking about. I walked into the uh, radiology office yesterday and found this. They were looking at this uh, picture on the left, and this I've never seen this. Uh, this is actually the profunda femoral artery and the superficial femoral artery. They're very large, but they're calcified all the way down. The picture on the right is the dorsalis pedis on the top of the foot, and that's a very common finding. You can have calcifications anywhere and everywhere, behind the knee, in the superficial femoral artery, and in your tibial uh, vessels. Um, so they can give you artifacts pretty much everywhere. This is a normal arterial uh, tracing. It's triphasic. And A is the systolic forward flow. B is the brief re uh, reverse flow, the diastolic component. When the uh, cardiac valves close, the flow reverses. And C is the uh, forward flow uh, going forward. So that's a normal triphasic waveform here on the left. On the right, you can see a monophasic waveform. I think these are much easier to hear than they are to see. And uh, when you're doing this, you hopefully have the advantage of having a, the uh, volume up on your uh, machines. And here, again, uh, top A is triphasic, B is monophasic, and you've lost the baseline, the reverse flow here. And then uh, C is a monophasic uh, abnormal wave. This is what normal waves look like uh, in different parts of the body with normal vessels. And this is a popliteal and a posterior tibial below an SFA occlusion. And so the waveform is monophasic and rounded, pretty much the same contour, maybe a little different amplitude, but that's what the waveforms look like below an occlusion. And the, the shapes stay pretty much the same unless you get a uh, multi-level disease. The picture here uh, of the limbs on the right, this is our normal waveforms, okay, that you would see. Um, and then on the left, this patient has a, a blockage in the SFA artery, and you can see the waveforms start to round. There are no other blockages in this limb, and the, the remaining distal limb uh, waveforms are normal. So the, the criteria for interpretation of segmental pressures, the high thigh should be 20 to 30 millimeters higher than the brachial artery. Um, a gradient of 20 millimeters between the arms suggests that there is an obstruction in the arm with the lower blood pressure. And when you look at this, you compare the high, the uh, brachial pressure with the high thigh pressure, and then you compare vertically up and down um, pressure between the segments and pressure between the legs uh, horizontally. So any difference of 20 millimeters up and down or across ways is considered abnormal. So you can calculate a gradient at any level to determine the uh, disease location. Um, if your high thigh pressure um, is uh, um, and your brachial pressure are different, you can you can have a um, aortoiliac disease. If you're using a three cuff technique, you may have superficial uh, proximal artery disease and profunda disease as well. Um, if your high thigh to above knee pressure has a gradient, there could be SFA or SFA and profunda disease. If you have um, the um, above knee and below knee, it could be the distal SFA or the pop. And then if you compare the below knee to the ankle, it could be tibial perineal disease. So if we look at a high thigh uh, index, the high thigh index is the thigh pressure divided by the highest brachial index, or by its pressure to give you your index. Normal is considered greater than 1.2 in the thigh. If it's 0.8 to 1.2, you probably have aeroiliac disease. And if it's less than uh, 0.8, you may well have an iliac occlusion. The, uh, there should not be greater than a 15 to 20 millimeter drop in the upper arm to the lower arm. Um, and if there is, you may have a brachial artery obstruction or obstruction in both radial arteries or a single forearm artery that may be uh, decreased with its pressure is it may give you that abnormality. Between the forearm and the wrist, you should not have, again, a significant pressure drop. And if you do, there may be radial and ulnar pressures um, that are, ab are abnormal. The radial and ulnar artery pressure should be within 15 to 10, 10 mil uh, millimeters of each other. If there's a big difference or greater than 20 millimeters, there's usually an obstruction in the vessel with the lower pressure. <laughs> 
Um, we talked a little bit about analog waveforms. Again, we look at waveform morphology with the pulsatility, the forward flow, and the early diastolic reverse flow. A normal wave here, the spectra is the speed of the blood cells moving, and you can really see that on your arterial duplex imaging for another day. And this bottom picture, again, is moderately abnormal with loss of reverse flow. The baseline comes up, and um, you have some broadening as, as you go through this. So how do you interpret this? Well, I start with looking at the ABIs, and you, then you confirm that the ankle waveforms correlate with your ankle pressures. If the ankle pressures are normal, the ankle waveform should be normal. If the pressures are low, the waveform should be abnormal. Then you try to figure out the location of the disease. Are you using three cuffs or four cuffs? Um, do you have inflow disease versus uh, infraingle disease? And then you want to assess the high thigh PVRs or the common femoral analogs and the thigh pressures. You want to determine what other levels may be involved and determine the, the severity of the disease itself. So looking at this study, this is a four-cuff technique. John Doe has an ABI on the right of 0.96 and on the left of 0.57. The waveforms on the right are pretty much normal all the way down. You don't see any change. You go to the waveforms on the left and you can see that the femoral waveform is abnormal. So this patient probably has uh, air, uh, iliac disease on the left or common femoral disease. Uh, the waveforms as below that level are all pretty consistent and don't change so that he does not look like he has multi-segment disease. If you look at the pulse volume recordings, and this is the same patient, pulse volume recordings are normal on the right and on the left you can see the thigh pressure is abnormal and the waveforms are rounded and, and remain abnormal all the way down. So that's consistent with uh, inflow disease on the left side and a normal right leg. So what are the criteria to interpret these PVRs and PPG waveforms? Uh, normal, it has a sharp systolic peak with a prominent notch. Mildly abnormal, you have a sharp peak, an absent dichrotic notch. The downslope come, becomes bowed away from the baseline. Moderately abnormal, you have flattening. Uh, the upslope and, and downslope times decrease, and there's nearly equal um, in their uh, time and then you have the absent dichrotic notch. Severely abnormal, you have absent or low pulse wave with an equal upslope and downslope time. If you look at that, here you see basically a normal with a dichrotic notch, a moderately diseased waveform, and then a severe dip waveform. Some people think they can really tell these apart. I think when you're doing patients with motion and things, they can be hard to sort. Um, this uh, report from Nicolaides I looked at uh, trying to break them out into uh, eight different waveforms. Basically, if you take the top two, A and B, they're considered normal. I consider C and D um, mild disease, and the uh, E and F ones, the third column down, I would be moderate, and the severe ones are the two, two bottom ones. I think it's too hard to, to differentiate that to that level. So the continuous wave Doppler ultrasound is used to obtain velocity waveforms and to measure systolic blood pressures at sequential segments of both the upper and lower extremity in a traditional non-invasive peripheral artery evaluation. Analysis of the, of the morphology of the common femoral Doppler waveform can add useful information and localize in which segment um, rather than the, the uh, segmental blood flow recording alone. A unilaterally depressed proximal thigh pressure measurement could be due to occlusive disease in either the common or iliac arteries or the proximal SFA. And again, uh, the three cup technique and four cup technique will help you with that. Um, if you uh, uh, consider um, the qualitative uh, review um, from a waveform and have a low resistive signal, uh, it, it usually indicates that there's an occlusive disease, most likely in the common or external iliac. These are monophasic waveforms with slow upstroke rounded peak and uh, slow downstroke with no reversal. There is a caveat, however, and this patient has an external iliac occlusion, but the PVR may be normal because of all these large collaterals. So the, the analog waveform here will be the, the trick, or, trick to interpreting what's really going on with this patient. So if you're looking at um, qualitative evaluation and it helps you to differentiate uh, sites, again, the high resistance Doppler indicates iliac arteries are relatively free of occlusive disease and that the proximal SFA artery or the profunda may be involved. And these waveforms are usually um, triphasic or maybe biphasic, and they have a rapid upstroke 
and rapid downstroke and a sharp peak with flow reversal. So again, this is what normal waveforms look like in different locations uh, at rest. And for those of us that need reminders, again, this is these are all recorded in the psi, the high psi, normal, sharp upstroke, a prominent reflected wave, a dichrotic notch, and a late systolic um, and early diastolic flow. Mild disease, the second one down, um, waveform starting to broaden out, and you've lost your reflected rave, wave. Um, there's a decrease in amplitude as well. Moderately abnormal in the rounding, there's no reflected wave, and there's significant decrease in amplitude. Severely abnormal again, amplitude is falling away, uh, and they're turning, uh, losing their pulsatility. You can get a to and fro signal or tardis parvus with vessel occlusion, and this can be a monophasic signal with a kind of prolonged systolic upstroke and diastolic forward flow without any uh, reversal. And that usually is a vessel that's occluded. If we correlate the platysmography and the Doppler waveforms, the sonography waveforms are on the top, and you can see normal, mild, and moderate with the Doppler waves on the bottom. And those would be corresponding to the same degree. So if we look at a normal uh, patient study, the uh, break of blood pressure here is 130. In the thigh, it's 140 with a normal wave. And in the calf, you see good augmentation. This has to do with cuff fit. Your calf um, volumes should always be uh, increased to about 20%. Um, and that has to do with cuff fit, not with anything else. It's easier to measure the pressure in the calf. And so this is a normal study with normal waveform. If we look at an isolated aortoiliac patient, blood pressure is 120, thigh pressure is um, 80, and you can see the rounding of the waveform. Um, the calf is the same, 80 to 80, so it's a got augmentation, and there's no distal disease. This is an inflow problem. If you look at an isolated superficial femoral artery, blood pressure is 120 in the arm, 80 in the thigh, and, and again, this depends on the degree of uh, SFA occlusion. Um, the, there can be a significant rounding and loss of amplitude, or this may, if it's an isolated section, be almost normal. You then see the big drop between the um, the above knee and the below knee segment, even though the pressures don't drop, you know there's an SFA problem because you've now lost your augmentation if you see the difference between these two waves. So there's no augmentation here, and that means superficial femoral or popliteal disease. In combined disease patients, again, break of pressure is 120, calf or thigh pressure is uh, 60, and calf pressure is 60, and you'll again see the waves really correspond to each other. They start to take on the look of the most proximal uh, level of the significant disease. Again, these are the thigh waves and the calf wave patterns with the different uh, uh, forms of uh, disease. This patient uh, has a break of pressure 186 and a thigh pressure of 188. But then as you get to the knee, it's 168. And below the knee, it starts to drop away. And you can see the waveforms beginning to dampen out. And you can see this patient has multi-level disease. You've got a pressure drop in the thigh, you've got a pressure drop in the tibials, and the ABI is 0.67. This is an interesting uh, slide that I borrowed from Dr. Komczynski's book, which is no longer in print. But the slide on the left basically shows a normal angiogram, at least in the AP view. Um, I would tell you, I don't know that it's really normal because there's a dye density difference here, but the waveform is almost normal here. Um, and you don't, or the waveform here is monophasic, monophasic, excuse me, and the angiogram was interpreted as normal. So those are disparate, but you need to have oblique views of this iliac to really see what's going on because there's some disease in here that's missed um, on the read of the angiogram. This picture, this middle picture, shows a pretty classic stenotic iliac lesion and the monophasic waveform. The far right picture is interesting in that it shows a normal triphasic flow. And if you look at the black arrow in that picture, you'll see a shelf-like plaque that is not uh, flow limiting. So this would be somebody that when you put them on a treadmill or did reactive hyperemia testing, you would see this waveform change rather significantly. This patient has about an 80% iliac uh, stenosis. Again, you can get false uh, negative PVRs, and here's um, big collaterals at the ankle on the left, in the uh, abdomen and pelvis on the, in the middle, and then at the knee on the right. So you can get abnormal waveforms all the way down. Again, uh, PPGs that are normal um, 
and then borderline, and then severely abnormal with flattening. Normal PPG tracings in the finger and the calf and the toe have somewhat different contours, and here's what we would consider normal um, in all those areas. This is a typical uh, digital uh, PPG. Um, the normal one is the bottom one. The middle one is an obstructed one. And the top one is a, a vasoconstricted one with this peak or bird beak uh, top uh, waveform. And you can see the bird beaking that you see with vasospasm. So the criteria for Renault's testing with your pressure temperature sensor, the normal patient will return to baseline in five to 10 minutes. And people with vasospastic disease will take uh, a while to come back. Um, you can ignore the, the uh, um, pictures uh, as far as the waveforms coming up because they don't necessarily match. They're just there for illustration. This is what uh, a cold um, immersion study looks like, the right finger, uh, index finger, pre-submersion, immediately post and at two minutes. And you can see it's not coming back. It's still rather blue and not warm. If you look at the resting uh, digits here, on the right side, uh, the first uh, through five are pretty much normal. On the left side, the first two are normal, but then three, four, and five are flattened at the baseline. They do post-warming after submersion, and they really don't change. This is a patient with an obstruction and not vasospasm. So he's got completely occluded vessels that are not spastic in nature. Disadvantages of your PPGs, you don't have an audible so, uh, signal to assist in determining the ret return of flow. The wave forms can be contaminated with noise or artifact, making it hard to discern what's the true returning pulse pressure. And in patients with severe disease, the toe perfusion and PPG pulses will flatline before the fetal Doppler signals go away. And PPG pressures cannot be obtained if the trace is flatlined. PPG does have some advantages and it has less operator dependence. It uh, can be done simultaneously on both sides. It's convenient. Patients like it because it's much more comfortable. It, the um, digital uh, pulse volume changes can be related to uh, skin temperature. This is a normal person and you see that uh, even at normal temperature and then even with slight changes, they don't change the wave much until they get to significant vasoconstriction, and that would be about a 10 degree temperature change. So the normal response to cold is a linear drop, uh, and you can see that. The obstructive pattern is very similar and goes down uh, much like that. If you have vasospasm, the patients will have a steeper decline in pressure until they reach a threshold, and then they have almost complete occlusion. And you can see the curves here as that, that's moving through. Again, uh, normal looking upper artery uh, forms at all levels. And then you get to the fingers and you see the peaking and the birds peaking on the first right, first and second ones, and then the left, uh, first and second and third digits. And this patient has a component of vasospasm. Um, this uh, patient has uh, abnormal waves in all, basically all the digits. And this patient has fixed disease. Um, you can see the gangrene of the fingertip. And this patient has scleroderma which uh, you really can't reverse. This patient is diabetic, chews her fingers, has small vessel disease, has some infection. And you can see on her uh, right side, they're pretty abnormal uh, PPGs all the way down. The left are not as bad. She did go on to lose. This is a Palmer space infection that she got in here. She ended up losing part of her hand with this. Um, again, upper extremity study on the right side, pretty normal waves all the way down, pretty normal pressures. The wrist brachial index is 1.02 on the right. On the left, it's 0.69, and you start to see a pressure gradient between the um, upper arm and the lower arm, and then you see the waveforms in the radial and ulnar are really abnormal, and so this patient probably has some brachial artery disease as well as significant radial and ulnar disease. And this patient, actually, that patient that we just looked at had a, a subclavian artery aneurysm and was embolizing to his hand. And again, you can see different uh, waveforms with this, but there's really not much you can do with that. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the stress and the treadmill testing. Uh, again, we use 2%, uh, 2 miles an hour at 12% uh, grade for five minutes. The toe count that uh, Dr. Pinsky talked about is uh, basically 50 tiptoe raises. 
You want to record when the patient becomes symptomatic and what the symptoms are. If it's just deconditioning, it's one thing. If it's shortness of breath, if it's another thing. If it's, ouch, my calf really hurts and I have to stop, that's a different thing. So make sure you record accurately when and, and what they complain of when you stop the test. This is a normal exercise uh, test. And if you look at this, the um, normal person can go for more than five minutes and not have a problem. The patient with moderate disease will start to have symptoms at uh, two to four minutes and then recover. And patients with severe disease have symptoms earlier and will ask you to stop. Um, again, the uh, treadmill walking distances for normal people is pretty much unlimited. If you have uh, popliteal disease, you may start to complain between uh, three and four minutes, superficial femoral artery disease, a little bit quicker uh, and less exercise tolerance, aeroiliac disease, two minutes to three minutes, and they'll start to complain, and multi-level disease, even less tolerance. Again, resting uh, and post-exercise or post-stress, you can see how the waveforms round out and change here. On the uh, right side, the pressure here post-exercise will be 75 divided by 215. And so you can see an, a significant abnormality. And this patient had an 80% uh, external iliac uh, stenosis. This is the patient probably from that picture I showed you with the shelf-like plaque. Exercise stress testing is considered abnormal if there's a 20% drop and it remains low for three minutes. If it returns to normal in less than five minutes, it usually is a single vessel level disease. If it takes 10 minutes to come back, it's usually multi-level and you should follow this out till you're back to within 10 millimeters of mercury from your um, baseline. This uh, again is a post treadmill exercise, triphasic normal waveform. And then you see post exercise, you, you've lost your reverse flow and you're above baseline and you're rounding out with low resistance flow um, in patient who has uh, a common femoral artery uh, stenosis. Uh, reactive hyperemia testing, again, you induce a peripheral um, decreased vascular resistance by the lactic acidosis and the oxygen demand. The magnitude of the resistance decrease is dependent on the duration of the ischemic time. And most times this is limited by pain or patient tolerance. Um, five minutes, uh, is about all anybody can do, and 20 to 50 millimeters above the systolic pressure is what you want to do and have a reproducible study. Um, you don't want to do this if people have some pop grafts in. Um, you can test both legs simultaneously, but it's important that you elevate um, the limbs to 45 degrees before you start to do venous emptying and to be more comfortable for patients so they'll tolerate it better. Um, and again, the patients, normal patients here will actually have a small dip because the acidosis and it comes back to normal rather quickly. Patients with um, moderate claudication, it takes them longer and severe claudication and multi-level disease takes even longer to get back to normal. And again, reactive hyperemia testing is um, uh, normal with a, uh, a mild drop initially um, and 35 to 50% suggests a single level disease, greater than 50% suggests multi-level uh, disease. Um, these are normal um, digital volume um, after reactive hyperemia testing. You can see here a normal potion will have almost a doubling. Um, the remainder of these are recorded on a 100% um, a two times uh, sensitivity. Um, this patient has a SFA occlusion. You can see the normal waveform and then the reactive hyperemia testing. Um, if this patient doesn't have much of a response. This is a diabetic who really already is vasodilated and so um, really, you don't see much change with that. And this patient has multi-level disease, and so you can see that they don't change much either. You can use these uh, devices for Allen testing. We do this uh, with the radial artery hearts that the heart guys are doing, as well as before we do um, the placement of AV fistulas or dialysis grafts. And you're looking at the palmar arch and compressing the radial ulnar artery. And here you can see the fifth digit goes flat uh, with compression, so the arch is not really complete. You can do thoracic outlet testing with position testing, um, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, the Edson testing, the stick of up in the, the uh, uh, symptomatic position. And here you can see the right side, there's an abnormality here and the 180 degrees as well as the symptomatic position, the left side was normal. Their baseline PPGs and PRGs may be all normal, or they may have uh, embolic disease. So that um, 
is uh, pretty much the end of that. Interestingly, I just received last week on my desk this report on a patient we sent for a study. And you can see here that all the vessels are non-compressible and the um, patient has some wounds. And the impression here says bilateral ABI is not obtained due to non-compressible vessels. Bilateral DBI is abnormal and no 10 digits. Well, I tell you, the DBI here is, is zero. But if we look further into this, the patient is a smoker, he's diabetic, hypertensive, hyperlipidemic, and has ulcers on his great toes. And you can see what we just talked about for the raw data. Here you can see the femoral analog waveform. The right side is normal. The left side, again, has some subtle changes, and the amplitude is different. If we go to the pulse bomb recordings, you can see on this left side significant changes that correspond with that uh, inflow disease on this left side. Then you see a big step off here between the low thigh and the calf. So he's got superficial femoral popliteal disease as well. And this is not exactly the same as that, but there may be some tibial disease as well on the left. If we look on the right, you uh, actually start to see decreased augmentation here. So he may have some distal SFA disease and he for sure has tibial disease between the calf and the ankle, you see the waveforms change. And that gives you these toes. So there's a lot more information than what I got in that original report. If we go back to the report, it basically says um, he's got no compressible vessels and uh, basically abnormal um, DBIs as well with no flow. So that uh, doesn't help somebody who's trying to figure out what we can do to help this patient. So in conclusion, the greater the peripheral artery disease, the more similar the Doppler and the platysmic waveforms become. Dr. Kuczynski in his textbook in 1982 stated that using the pulse bomb recording and qualitative pattern recognition type analysis for resulting from segmental waveforms, he could correctly localize the aeroiliac disease in 97% of limbs. Bob Rutherford in 1979, the American Journal of Surgery reported reliance on measurements of PVRs alone underestimates the severity of the aortic disease and should be combined with measurements of segmental limb pressures for maximal accuracy. So I thank you for your attention. I know we're a little hurried, and I think we have time for questions. There is a uh, there are nine cases that will be available for you to practice on, um, and uh, see uh, how well you can interpret these. Thanks for your attention. Okay, at this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Marge Hutchison, Director of Accreditation for Vascular Testing, assisting us with the Q&A session today. Marge, would you like to start us off? I would. Thank you, Kelly. Um, in light of the time, I just want to inform everybody that if you submitted a question online, we will answer it in the next few weeks, so don't feel as though your question will not be answered. Um, Emory, there's been some talk, uh, several questions about adjusting the gain on your waveforms. Um, and we see all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of waveform sizes here. Can you address that a little bit? Sure, to keep it quick, I think um, it depends on who your reading physicians are. If they're aware enough by looking at your uh, PVR waveforms or CW waveforms and realize you've adjusted the gain, most of the instruments will uh, display what gain was used. I think it's important to make the waveform large enough to be interpretable, and the contour of the waveform gives a tremendous amount of information, I think much more than the overall amplitude. Uh, but there is definitely a camp who wants to keep the gains the same uh, on all the levels. So um, you just need to make sure your physician and you are on the same page. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lohr, can you address um, doing physiologic studies on patients with stents and bypass grafts? So again, I showed you that you don't want to do um, um, reactive hyperemia testing um, using a blood pressure cuff on somebody who has a fem pop graft in. Same thing for people who have a fem uh, uh, superficial femoral artery stent. You really don't want to do that, even though you probably couldn't hurt the stent. Um, the patients always will have in their head that you damaged the stent somehow. So if they have stents in the SFA, we don't put a blood pressure cuff on and do um, reactive hyperemia testing. We will do um, the pulse bomb recordings um, in all of the arteries. Um, so that's, that's really not a big issue. And because the pressure on the cuffs is, is over a long area, it usually is not a problem at all. 
going to ask one more question, and that is when is uh, treadmill or stress testing um, indicated and when is it not indicated on the patient? We do stress testing for patients who have symptomatic claudication but normal studies. If they have abnormal studies, you shouldn't need to do it because you've already got your answer. And if you have a patient who is unsteady or has cardiac history, we don't do them because we don't have a nurse to monitor them. So we don't stress them on the, on the treadmill. You can still do reactive hyperemia testing um, or tiptoe testing if they're able to tolerate it. You don't want to do it if anybody has angina and chest pain and all that stuff. So that's, that's the group that, that we don't test. Okay, we're going to let Kelly finish us out here. Okay, thanks again, everyone, and a very special thank you to Dr. Lohr and Dr. Kopinski for this presentation today. As Marge mentioned, we will address your questions in the next few weeks. We had a lot of great ones. Uh, please feel free to contact IEC with any additional questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Performance and Interpretation of Arterial Physiologic Testing. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event, then click the blue Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete your survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.